Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we are going to discuss understanding the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act and reasonable accommodations. Today, what we're going to be discussing is just understanding FMLA and work leave, um, understanding reasonable accommodation requests, and then situations where either of those will apply. I've already been introduced, so we don't need to meet me. Okay. So an overview of your rights for medical and disability leave. When an employee becomes ill, um, when they become disabled, when you get sick on the job, uh, and not just like a cold sick, you are entitled to certain protections under federal law. There are two different protections that we are going to discuss today. One is the Family and Medical Leave Act, so FMLA. This will apply to employees that have serious health conditions, um, or they are caring for an immediate family member who has a serious health condition. The other one is the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA. So this one protects employees who are disabled from being discriminated against um, in employment related activities. First, we'll start with FMLA. FMLA provides up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Um, most everybody will get trained on this when you begin employment. Employers that are covered are all private employers, 50 or more. Employers with less than 50 employees can also elect to provide similar benefits, but they are not required to under the FMLA Act. All public agencies, private and public schools, regardless of the employee count, are also covered under FMLA. Employees that are covered include, um, they've worked for their current employer for at least 12 months. You've worked 1,250 hours over that 12-month span, and they are part of an employer that has 50 or more employees. FMLA definitions, so serious health conditions, as I noted earlier, it's a lot broader than that of a disability definition, which we will cover later. This includes matters like pregnancy, um, many illnesses, injuries, impairments, or physical and mental conditions that require multiple treatments over a long period of time. So if you have intermediate absences as well, this is going to cover that if the absence is related to your health condition. Situations where FMLA is not offered cosmetic surgery, headaches. Headache does not include migraines. Keep that in mind. Colds and routine medical or dental care. FMLA is unpaid, so by definition, it is an unpaid leave. Some employers might require the employee to take all of their leave, including sick and vacation time, prior to utilizing FMLA. Um, some employees also elect to do this on their own, but most employers that I know do require this. Further situations that allow for FMLA use, birth of a son or daughter, um, bonding with that newborn child, that does also include adoption and bonding with the newly adopted child, to care for an immediate family member uh, with a serious health condition and immediate family member is also limited. So it will only include your spouse, child, or parents. It does not include a parent in law, um, and it also does not include brothers or sisters, uncles, anyone outside of pretty much your spouse, child, or parent. To take medical leave when an employee is unable to work um, because of serious health conditions, caring for a family member, as we noted before, who was injured uh, during military service, and then family members who are deployed in the National Guard and reserve personnel. They do get special privileges under this law. Now, the ADA. Title I of the ADA prohibits employers from discriminating against people with disabilities and employment-related activities. As I noted earlier, the definition of a disability is different from the definition of a serious health condition. This includes recruitment processes all the way up from pay to benefits. Covered employees under the ADA are employers, state, or government with at least 15 employees, and to all employment agencies, labor organizations, and joint labor management committees and that is regardless of the employee headcount. Covered employees also includes employees with disabilities um, that are covered to perform the job. They have the skills and qualifications to carry out the essential functions of the position with or without an accommodation. Uh, we will get to that definition of disability and what a reasonable accommodation is as well. Employers may grant leave to the employee requesting the accommodation in order to allow the employee um, a comparable resource to a similarly situated employee without a disability 
In essence, what all of this means is that under the ADA, the purpose of the law is to provide an employee the ability to do all of the jobs, um, the job duties, anything that would be required by the job with an accommodation. So an individual with a disability is defined as follows. The individual has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more life activities, or the individual has a record of such an impairment, or the individual is regarded as having an impairment. The ADA does not require employers to provide leave for medical or and or dis disability purposes. Um, the ADA does require employers to make reasonable accommodations for qualified employees with disabilities to perform the essential functions of their role. So as I mentioned earlier, it, it allows you to do all of the job duties with an accommodation that you are unable to do if you are disabled. Accommodations depend on individual circumstances and will generally be granted unless doing so would result in undue hardship for the employer. This is pretty much standard. So if the agency or the employer has an undue hardship in providing whatever accommodation you're requesting, um, then that is what uh, a higher court or a judge or an administrative court is going to look at to see whether or not the accommodation is reasonable. Who is covered? So the Rehabilitation Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs conducted by federal agencies, in programs receiving federal financial assistance, in federal employment, and in the employment practices and federal contractors. Under the Rehabilitation Act, an employee may qualify as disabled if the employee has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major activities, which should sound familiar since it is in the definition under the ADA of a disability. Major life activities include working, sitting, lifting, sleeping, walking, anything that you don't really think of doing, but you do automatically in your everyday life. Disabilities can prohibit those things which do impact our work, impact our job, and our ability to do our job. So major life activity is not really a major life activity, it's just something you do every single day. An employee may also be considered disabled under the Rehabilitation Act if the employee has a record of such impairment or is regarded as having such an impairment. An example of this, a record of impairment is a history of one suffering from a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits major life activities. The employee may have a record of impairment even if he or she has fully recovered from the disabling condition. An example of that is going to be cancer. Right? If you are in remission for cancer, you do have a history of such an impairment, and that will qualify you as being a disabled person. The Rehabilitation Act, um, I would also like to note, is uh, like a secondary level off of the ADA. So the reason why we're speaking about the Rehabilitation Act is because it applies to federal employees. The ADA is going to apply to all employers under the definition that we provided. Rehabilitation Act also feeds off of the ADA, so it pretty much mimics and puts into um, codified law the ADA through the Rehabilitation Act for federal employees and federal agencies. <clears throat> Who is covered under the Rehabilitation Act? A person is regarded as having a disability if his or her supervisor uh, or other agency employee believes that the person has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities or mistakenly believes that the person has such impairment. Although I will note that it is not implied, um, it is not an implied belief. So they have to have some reason through some kind of communication or action to have that knowledge. An example of being regarded as having a disability is if the person has difficulty hearing but is not deaf and the employer erroneously believes that the person is deaf. Under these circumstances, the employee may be able to file a complaint with the agency's EEO office alleging he or she is being discriminated against because of the agency's erroneous uh, belief that they are disabled. Um, I will also note that there needs to be some kind of adverse action. So they need to take some action against you because of that belief that they are deaf and be wrong about that. What is a reasonable accommodation? A reasonable accommodation is an accommodation that is provided to a qualified person with a disability that accommodates a known physical or mental limitation. The agency is not required to provide the employee precisely the accommodation requested, 
but must provide an accommodation that is responsive to and tailored to a specific disability. The request for accommodation must be related to the limitation that renders the person disabled. How to make that accommodation. Requests are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So you have to look at your position description, look at your job, job duties, look at what you're responsible for within those job duties. If you spread the responsibility out among several people, if you're interviewing for a role, you want to communicate immediately with the person who's arranging the interviews because they are required in interviews um, to provide you with an accommodation that would permit you to go through that interview process as any person who is not disabled would be able to. Contact the agency's selective placement program coordinator. Sometimes they're also called the reasonable accommodation coordinator. Almost all federal agencies have them um, under one name or another. Contact the hiring manager to clarify what reasonable accommodations are needed and then make an oral or written request for that accommodation. I highly recommend that if you are a disabled person and you are um, seeking an accommodation, you want to speak with your doctor first to discuss what accommodations are going to be able to get you um, to doing the position description uh, and doing the duties that you need to do like a person who's not disabled. Examples of a reasonable accommodation. Telework, although I will put an asterisk next to that because telework is not always an appropriate reasonable accommodation based on the job. Um, and most employers who say you have to be in office, especially at this point in time, since telework is so common, usually say that because there is a reason behind that requirement. So telework is not always the best reasonable accommodation to ask for. Reduced working hours, very common. Part-time or modified work schedules, um, especially if you have uh, a lot of doctor's appointments that you need to go to, part-time or a modified work schedule will allow you to kind of work that in. Reassignments to a vacant position, we'll put an asterisk next to that as well, uh, because reassignment is a difficult accommodation to get since you are essentially trying to get into a position, saying you can do that, and now you're asking to leave that position. There are some um, exceptions there, but small asterisk there. Access to devices such as wheelchairs, modified computer screens, or other equipment, standing desks is a very common one uh, for people with lower back issues training qualified readers, adjustments or modifications to an examination, for example, if you are hearing impaired or sight impaired. What are the basic requirements for requesting an in-office reasonable accommodation? So first, the employer must establish that, uh, excuse me, employee must establish that they are a qualified person with a disability. This means meeting the requirements of the following. Having a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, as we discussed earlier, a major life activity is not really a major life activity. It is an activity that you do every single day. Standing, walking, sitting, typing, listening, anything like that. Um, that they still perform the essential functions of the position with a reasonable accommodation. A reasonable accommodation is just that. It is meant to allow you to perform the essential functions of the position with or without an accommodation. Second, the employee must follow the employer's procedures for requesting reasonable accommodations. And these procedures will vary depending on where you are employed. So providing medical documentation when requested, responding to reasonable inquiries by the employer regarding disability, working with the employer and identifying the reasonable accommodation. This is known as the interactive process. And the employee and his or her doctor must provide the employer with a description of the disability the probable length of the condition and the reasons why the reasonable accommodation is necessary. This is why I suggested earlier that you speak with your doctor about what your doctor is willing to say an accommodation is needed because you have to work with your doctor later on. For the most part, most agencies and employers are going to require medical documentation to support your request for a reasonable accommodation, especially if it, it requires the employer to spend money. Um, they need a reason to do that and medical documentation is their reason. To determine whether the requested accommodation is reasonable, the employees may look into what accommodations have been granted to similarly situated employees. Similarly situated is uh, in quotation marks because that is a very specific definition. We are not providing the definition here. However, a similarly situated person is um, similar disability, under the similar employer, uh, under a similar supervisor, doing similar job duties. 
So think about people who do the same work that you do under the same supervisor in the same conditions. That is a similarly situated person. Uh, ask their supervisor what accommodation they believe is reasonable. This is a part of that interactive process. You can suggest what reasonable accommodation you want. Your doctor can suggest what reasonable accommodation they think that you need, but that does not mean that the supervisor has no say in what they believe a reasonable accommodation is going to be. Consult with your HR department, so reasonable accommodation coordinator for the most part, and then consult with the EEO office to determine what accommodations are reasonable. The extent of the agency's obligations to provide a reasonable accommodation. The agency is only required to provide an in-office reasonable accommodation to the extent that the agency is aware of the person's disability and aware of the person's request for reasonable accommodation. So they can't just see you struggle. You have to actually ask for something. You don't need to use the term reasonable accommodation specifically, but you do need to voice that you need some assistance in order to accomplish your job duties. No, it is extremely important to precisely identify the employee's requested accommodation and ensure that the appropriate agency officials are aware. Um, your supervisor is someone who is appropriate to make aware. Your coworker is not an appropriate person to notify. The EEO office, appropriate. The reasonable accommodation coordinator, appropriate. Um, but your friends at the office, not appropriate. You need to tell the right people. If the employee presents a direct threat or a significant risk of substantial harm to the health and safety of the individual or others that cannot be eliminated or reduced by the reasonable accommodation, then the agency is not required to provide a reasonable accommodation. In other words, there has to be some harm to the agency in providing whatever reasonable accommodation is being requested. So, for example, if you are asking to completely not do any of the job duties that are under your position description, at that point in time, there is harm to the agency because the agency is not getting the job done that they hired someone to do. The extent of the agency's obligation to provide reasonable accommodations. Continued. Um, the agency is not responsible uh, for providing accommodations that you require or that you request, as I noted. This is a very long one, so I'm just going to summarize that one. If you're asking, for example, um, top of the line electric scooter, and instead they give you a wheelchair, that accomplishes the same function for the most part. It always depends on what your medical documentation is going to say, and it's going to depend on what your doctor is requiring, right? So if you cannot move a mechanical wheelchair yourself, then asking for an electric scooter can be reasonable, and then the mechanical wheelchair unreasonable but if you're capable of moving a wheelchair, then you don't need a scooter, right? So it will depend there. The agency does not have to provide the requested accommodation, only an accommodation that is reasonable. Therefore, the agency and the employee may have a difference of opinion on what a reasonable accommodation is under the circumstances. One of the biggest issues that we see in this specific area is what the employee is requesting is not always um, what the agency can provide easily a lot of money can be substantially harmful to, to the agency. So a lot of times they will say, does this work, does that work? You have to engage in that interactive process. If you don't engage in the interactive process and an alternative accommodation is provided to you that you reject or decline, that will raise a question of law and that will, um, you can file an EEO complaint on that, but it is difficult if that alternative accommodation is reasonable. So you need to engage, speak with your doctor, speak with HR, speak with the supervisor, talk to everyone and see if the alternative is going to work. If not, then continue to request what you're asking for. Um, but you do need to have a reason behind it other than this is what I want. If you are denied a reasonable accommodation, if you're denied a reasonable accommodation, um, you have to take the right steps in order to be able to pursue any kind of discrimination complaint. So one, step one is contact your EEO counselor. You have 45 days in order to contact an EEO counselor to file an informal complaint. And um, there are certain procedures that each one have for each different agency. Provide the agency with additional information that supports your reasonable accommodation. So all, all your communications, right? Take notes 
write things down when when things happen, dates of things, names, very important to keep very documented and detailed notes about what has occurred while you're requesting the accommodation because that information is going to be asked for and um, it's best not to just recall it off the top of your head. Consider whether the agency's proposed alternative accommodation, if one is offered, is reasonable. That's that interactive discussion we were talking about. It may be beneficial to contact an experienced employment counsel. So if you have been denied a reasonable accommodation, there are a lot of things that we can do um, in having that discussion, but there's not much we can do if you are outside that 45 day time frame. So if an employee is denied reasonable accommodation, you have to contact the EEO counselor within 45 days in order to pursue an EEO complaint. If you miss that deadline, then um, there's not much that can be done unless they do something else to you. So I recommend contacting counsel if, you're, if you want to pursue an EEO complaint, do it within 15 to 30 days so that we have enough time to have those discussions about are you timely, can we file, what is it going to take to get a timely filed complaint. Once that complaint is filed, then we can go through and have the discussions about talking with talking with your boss, right? Talking with the supervisor, talking with HR, talking with the reasonable accommodation coordinator um, in order to get you what you want. But at the end of the day, we can't make something timely if we haven't been contacted timely. So when do these federal laws intersect? Employees that need time off for medical and disability purposes should also remember that they have rights covered under both FMLA and ADA at the same time. Several states have enacted their own FMLA laws, so you do want to look at per state as well if FMLA is something that um, might not be enough time or might not have enough coverage for you. When an employee can be covered by both state and government, they are entitled to the greater benefit or more generous rights under the different parts of each law. Steps the employers will take regarding medical or disability requests. So look to see what laws apply to an employee. The ADA, again, applies to employers for 15 or more employees. The FMLA applies to private employers with 50 or more employees. They do cover different things, right? So look to see which one is covered under each employee. FMLA is serious health conditions. The ADA provides you with reasonable accommodations, not time off. In both situations, the employee should be prepared to show medical certification. So, it is very important that you speak with your doctor before even asking for any of these things. The employer will take steps. Um, look to see what en entitlements an employee can receive once they are able to return to work. The accommodations once returning to the workplace might include um, different work schedules, different work assignments. We did have a uh, slide earlier that kind of goes through some very common things that are asked for, but again, it does depend on what you need, right? What it is that your disability needs to be accommodated for, what your job is, speak with your doctor. I can't say that enough. Talk with your doctor to make sure that when you use something like FMLA, you get that time off to heal. When you come back, if you do have still a qualifying disability, what is it that you need in order to do the position job? How inexperienced, if anything, can help you. So we do cover a lot of different things um, when we go through each of the uh, each person's case. Like I said earlier, everyone's case is very different because everyone has a different circumstance. Everyone has a different job. Um, so you have to really tailor it to what you do. We can assist with submitting reasonable accommodation requests. Right? We can send demand letters. Um, we can be that coordinating person to take any kind of stress that you have off of you. Uh, we can counsel you through different situations, so we do have an advice and assist where I will let you know what is reasonable, what is not reasonable under the law, and you can make the determination based on our counsel. We can determine what exceptions to the rule applies, acquiring and developing evidence to prove your claims or helping you notate everything, um, make sure that we have the evidence if this doesn't require any EO complaint. And then we can negotiate with the agency to settle your dispute. So if we get into an EEO complaint or if we just have reasonable accommodation discussion through a demand letter, then we can have that conversation with the agency so that they're not directly contacting you. And we can be that third party intermediary, which can be very helpful um, to get everyone on the same page. 
get things settled so that you eventually get what it is you need to accomplish your job. If you have questions on that, we do encourage you to contact us. This is our direct line. Um, we also have an email that you can send an email to, and then we'll get you set up with our consult attorneys in order to have a discussion about your unique situation. And then we can set you up with a, an associate like myself or one of my other coworkers if you do retain. So um, there were some pre-submitted questions that I wanted to first address before we get into any other questions here. And let me make sure these any are being sent to me. Okay. So um, is management allowed to continue to request documentation when your FMLA is approved? Yes, they can. It always depends on the certain circumstances, um, but the end result is yes, they can. They can ask you if your circumstances change or if you're asking for something else, or if the accommodation is simply not working for either person, they can ask for more supporting documentation in order to provide um, you the accommodation that you need, but it's also not going to cause substantial harm to the agency. To the extent um, to which a supervisor is entitled to know medical information associated with the RA request, what medical information are they allowed to know? <clears throat> the medical documentation is provided from your doctor with your permission. So in order to provide an accommodation, they will need to know what it is um, you are diagnosed with and what limitations that diagnosis then has. I know it can be uncomfortable to have to have that conversation with your supervisor or with a reasonable accommodation coordinator because our medical information is personal to us. I understand that. However, um, if you are requesting a reasonable accommodation, the employer has to know what they're accommodating, like I said earlier, so they, they need to have that medical information. You can rest assured that there are protections under the law that pro prohibit your personal information from, from getting everywhere. So it is really a conversation between UHR and your supervisor, but they have to know, otherwise they're not falling under that knowledge requirement under the law. Can I receive an accommodation without a medical letter? It feels like it violates my HIPAA. So I wanted to address this one because this is actually pretty common um, in the last couple of years. HIPAA is not, a is not violated if you are providing your own medical information, which is what happens with a reasonable accommodation. Right, they can ask for it. That's not a violation of HIPAA. If your doctor is sending information out without your permission, that is a violation of HIPAA. So yes, um, you will need to provide medical documentation, especially under something like uh, FMLA. FMLA actually has documentation that requests that the doctor fill out information and provide support regarding what your disability is and how it needs to be accommodated in order to get that approved. And under the ADA for reasonable accommodation, you also need to provide medical documentation supporting that you are a disabled person and supporting that you need and require reasonable accommodation. So you can, if you have, I think, a really nice supervisor, right? Get accommodation without a medical letter, but it generally is not, it doesn't happen. If you wanna use FMLA for mental health issues, do you have to have documentation from a doctor? If you have a really nice supervisor, who um, wants to provide you with FMLA, sure, but generally FMLA is going to require documentation from a, doc from a doctor to support that you have a mental health issue that requires leave, because you can take up again to 12 weeks of leave under FMLA. What do you do if you face retaliation for requesting a reasonable accommodation? So retaliation is um, a very specific term but if you feel you are being retaliated because you requested a reasonable accommodation, you need to file within 45 days a, an EEO complaint because requesting a reasonable accommodation is considered prior EEO activity. And if someone is retaliating against you for prior EEO activity, then you are able to file an EEO complaint under the Equal Employment Opportunity um, laws to fight that, right? You have 45 days. So you are limited by time. You have to immediately contact your EEO coordinator. Uh, what are the consequences for violating your reasonable accommodation? I included this question in here because there are not many. Um, the purpose of an EEO complaint 
in order to, is, is to remedy the situation. It is not to provide punitive damages, which are not permitted under the EEO laws or regulations. So you can't go after someone and say, because you violated um, my reasonable accommodation, I would like to be punished. That's not the purpose of the laws. Um, the purpose is to set you back where you should have been. What is the difference between a reasonable accommodation and light duty? Light duty can be a reasonable accommodation. So if you are requesting um, not to have to pick up heavy boxes over 50 pounds, right? And that only pertains to 10% of your work duties, light duty can be a reasonable accommodation. So that is something that is reasonable to ask, but you have to coordinate with your doctor and your supervisor to make sure that it is something that the agency can coordinate with. Um, that's all the questions that I have. Do we have any questions on anyone else's end? Let me see if I can get into that chat box. Okay. What if the employer is unwilling to actually discuss this in good faith? That is a very subjective question. Um, if you're employer is unwilling to discuss in good faith a reasonable accommodation, then you need to file an EEO complaint, right? It, there is a line between them saying no and them denying the reasonable accommodation. There's really no other button to push other than file an EEO complaint to get that process moving. They have to come to the table at that point through the informal complaint phase. What if the agency's EEO investigator says there was no adverse action and encourages the employee to close the complaint? If you filed an EEO complaint and you are currently in the process of having it investigated and your supervisor um, tells you to close the complaint, file another complaint. That's per se violation. Uh, they shouldn't be telling you that at all. And it does need to be, I will caveat that, a very direct, you need to close your complaint, right? So there might not be an adverse action. They might be trying to tell you, we didn't do anything to you, or we've resolved the issue. But at the end of the day, they can't directly tell that to you. They have to go through the process of the EEO complaint with that EEO counselor or through your chosen representative. How many days do you have before you are allowed to submit a reasonable accommodation? If you require an accommodation because you are a person who is disabled, there is no day requirement to request that. So if you need um, assistance with typing, right, there are speech to text programs out there. Uh, you just have to coordinate with your reasonable accommodation coordinator and coordinate with your doctor to make sure that you have the medical documentation to back that up. I do also see a note in here that the EEO office functions as the RA coordinator. That is actually pretty common. So you can go to them and say, I need a reasonable accommodation, or you can say I need to file an EEO complaint, but you do need to make sure to be specific, right? If your EEO office is the same people as the RA coordinator, sometimes they might not file the EEO complaint when you are actually saying, I think I need to file an EEO complaint. You have to be very firm and say, I am filing an EEO complaint, please send me the documentation if required to fill out and sign because they can be a little bit tricky there. Um, if you go to the office and just say, I want to file a complaint and you don't sign any paperwork there, if it's required, then they're going to say you never filed a complaint, which is um, a bit of a hurdle that we have to get over. It's not impossible to get over the hurdle with that 45 day contact, but it is a bit of a hurdle that can be problematic if you wanted to file a complaint six months down the road, nothing happens. Um, and then we have to backtrack that and say, well, there was actual contact. Here's when it happened. Documentation was not necessary from our end. Agency didn't do what they needed to do. So that is a um, little tricky. So you need to be very direct when you want to file a complaint. Looks like that's all the questions that we have. Taylor? That's all the ones that I've received. <laughs>
Thank you everyone for joining today's presentation. And again, thank you, Jennifer, for presenting. Like stated in the beginning of the presentation, this presentation was recorded and a copy will be sent out to all attendees afterwards. I hope everyone has a good rest of their day.